I guess since we're past noon, I'll say good afternoon then. Um, I'm Rick Jansen. I'm, I'm a member of the Health Equity Work Group. Um, Lily asked me to share some of this information with you. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. Access to care is one of the social factors that will improve or harm a person's health status and access to care is a huge issue in a rural and frontier state like Wyoming. Um, the other thing she wanted me to point out is your zip code is a better predictor of your health than your genetic code. So where you live matters. Um, people inhabit environments that are shaped by policies, by external forces, by actions, um, that then influence their choices and behaviors over a lifetime and generations. Um, at Public Health Division, we're excited about the growing movement that's developing place-based solutions to place-based problems. Today, we're gonna to talk about telehealth in, in Wyoming, which is kind of the cutting edge as far as access to care. <clears throat> that's a fair statement. So it's my, well, I'm gonna, give you a little of Dr. Bush's background. He practiced internal medicine in Fort Collins for 24 years and has been with the Department of Health as our Medicaid medical director for, for 12 years. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Bush. Thank you all. Uh, we'll and telehealth. This is something that uh, when I first came to the state of Wyoming 12 years ago, Dr. Brent Sherrard, who was at that time the director of the Department of Health said, oh, is there anything you can do to help promote and develop telehealth in the state of Wyoming? So this definitely fell under other duties as assigned. So, but it has caught a lot of attention during the last election. Both gubernatorial candidates were uh, talking a lot about telehealth, but what, one thing I've learned is when you use a term like telehealth, uh, 10 different people, it has 10 different meanings. So what I'm planning on doing at this point in time is sort of giving you a little of the background on the history of how telehealth has developed in Wyoming over the last 12 years, some of the legislative statutes regarding telehealth, <clears throat> what is currently available and how to access it in Wyoming, and then sometime to talk about it. Because it is absolutely accurate. In a frontier state like ours, we have very limited access in many areas, we have limited numbers of providers. Everyone takes for granted that, you know, two to four hours of windshield time is nothing in the state of Wyoming, and it does not have to be that way. So, so what is telehealth? And that is a, sometimes people get confused between telemedicine and telehealth. Telemedicine is where you actually have the doctor-patient relationship, Telehealth is the use of technology to deliver health care, health information, or health education at a distance. That is the formal PERSA uh, definition. So when you talk about telehealth, there's the clinical. That's the telemedicine, which are patient visits or consultations. You can use um, store and board consultations. We've got other new uh, ways to have some clinical <coughs> But there's also the non-clinical, and we can't forget about that as well. There's provider training. We have things like echo clinics, where uh, physicians and, and other people can be trained over long distances. There's administrative meetings that can be held. Uh, some of our clinics now have multiple sites, and they can hold administrative meetings that way. There's public health, and I'll show you examples of all of those that are all going on in the state of Wyoming right now. It's important to remember that years ago, the Wyoming the legislature passed uh, Wyoming Statute 9-2-117, saying that the Department of Health shall form a consortium to include the OCIO, state agencies, and private health organizations to facilitate the operations of the statewide interoperable system. Its members will be appointed by the director of the Department of Health and shall include OCIO's representatives. This is some of the, I wanted to, everyone to read, learn or recall what the consortium is able to do, which is coordinate the development and promotion of statewide standards for an interoperable telemedicine telehealth network, promote definitions and standards, 
and we've done those. We promote the conformance and compliance with all privacy and security laws. We've done that. Seek funds for operations and enter into contracts. Well, unfortunately, the legislature cut all the funding to the consortium, but the consortium still lives, so we don't have any uh, contracts we can enter into beyond the basic telehealth network. But that capability rem remains and might become important again in the future. Uh, promote the voluntary exchange of health information and promote a network among state agencies. So in the course of the 12, uh, actually 10 years since the institution of the Wyoming consortium, uh, the initial vendor was Cheyenne Regional Medical Center who had already established well-working uh, telehealth partnerships. When it came time for pre-procurement, -pre they went to uh, toll of services out of Sheridan, Wyoming. And they elected on the uh, third re-procurement uh, to not uh, participate. And so our current vendor is the University of Wyoming Institute for Disability. The reason uh, they won primarily is they already had a statewide Zoom license. And we'll get into more in the future. It's been a very, very good partnership. So there are two organizations currently in the state of Wyoming. The Wyoming Telehealth Consortium, which is the legislative uh, mandate, and we meet on a quarterly basis. And with that, um, it does an open public meeting, and everyone who is interested in telehealth is welcome to come and attend. We also have it on Zoom. And so it, it's a wonderful resource. But then we actually have, with the University of Wyoming, the Wyoming Telehealth Network. That's the more clinical one. We have a good web page. A lot of people say, well, why isn't everything gathered in one spot? And actually, it all is. So if you just Google up Wyoming Telehealth Network, you'll come to this page, and it's a large page. So uh, this is the top of it. And you see there are areas for patients, which describe telehealth, and actually lists. All the providers in the state of Wyoming currently participating in telehealth and what it would take to contact them and to set up a telehealth visit. <laughs> For the providers, we also store all of our webinars. We have education and training on there. Again, the list of telehealth providers, a link to the telehealth consortium in the minutes, uh, a spot for the provider to enroll. We have a lot of resources, how do, and the provider toolkit sort of walks you through the whole process of if you're interested in providing telehealth or receiving telehealth, it's all there in the provider toolkit. And they also provide technical support. So it's a really good web page. Uh, you can spend days searching through it. <clears throat> so what is the current technology that we're using for the state of Wyoming? We're using, we now have an enterprise license for a HIPAA-compliant Zoom which is, of course, a web-based platform. Prior to this, we had what was called a bridge. And bridges were big, clunky, heavy, expensive, rapidly aging uh, computer devices. Uh, we actually, the state of Wyoming actually bought one. It's about $500,000 to buy a bridge. And then at the end of the service life, you have to go out and spend another $500,000 to buy another bridge. <clears throat> we have saw the opportunity that instead of when our old bridge was uh, aging out, and we said, <clears throat> the $500,000 we don't have, or we can contract with the University of Wyoming, glom on to their uh, uh, web-based tech, you know, technology with Zoom. And that was a really smart move, because now every time it upgrades, everything upgrades. What it also enables us to do is now people and doctors and patients can access it from any portal so whether it be, you know, their computer, their laptop, their iPad, or even their smartphone, if you can get an internet connection, you can get a HIPAA-compliant um, uh, connection. So any device with web access and a camera can now be used for telehealth. We already have those licenses, and we make these available to any provider in the state of Wyoming at no cost. So I'm a very cheap sort of person. It's my Scottish background. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So any Medicaid enrolled provider can now provide telehealth services that are appropriate for that medium. 
instead of us trying to detail and limit and restrict, what we're saying is in a situation like this, if you want to have tele-speech therapy, tele-physical therapy, tele-dentistry, that's all fine with us because each provider determines what can be done intellectually and ethically via telehealth. And there's a lot of things that can occur. Uh, let's just take the dentistry because I remember one dentist saying, well, dentistry is a full contact sport. Well, how about if your dental assistant goes to the school for school screening and there's a kid whose mouth she's not sure about, she can then connect and show the dentist that kid's uh, mouth via telehealth and say, okay, what do you want me to do with this? So there are, the imagination is limitless on what you can do via telehealth. As long as it doesn't require actual hands-on, that's important. The other thing that we wanted to make sure, at least with Medicaid, is that parity is that on, you know, there's pays at parity with in-person visits. And so it doesn't matter if you go to the office or if you're in your home, that's important, and it's really important for the rural setting because a lot of our people are <clears throat> have bad roads, mountain passes between them and their provider. And so, you know, I wanted to emphasize some of the health equity part. And so we had a, a physician in Saratoga, and he was really delighted when all of a sudden we said, if, even if the patient's in their home, you can do your follow-up visits and not make them you know, risk dangerous driving conditions and still get their health care. So that is really, really important. If the patient does come into an enrolled site, that's a Medicaid enrolled site, doctor's office, nursing home, et cetera, that site can actually also bill a, an originating site fee. It's about 25 bucks, and it sort of makes up for the use of the room, the use of your staff to make the connection. And so we have destination sites and originating sites. We kept the coding the same. We just add on a GT modifier for the provider and a G code for the originating site. So that's the only way we can track what's going on. Um, so we have really tried to make it as easy uh, as possible for people to use telehealth. As a physician, I was really concerned, though, about making sure the standards of care. I don't want people to think that telehealth is some sort of second best or second rate or cut rate healthcare. And one of the things that brought it really to our attention was we had some pharmacists who had a script phoned in from a, one of the teledocs. Well, there was a problem because there was an allergy that the pharmacy had on record that would have been a contraindication to that prescription. We couldn't find the physician. We didn't know where they were. We didn't know if they had a Wyoming license. And we could see that that was, you know, going to be a problem. <clears throat> so I sat down with the boards of medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and the insurance commissioner's office, and we developed a uniform policy for the appropriate use of telehealth in the delivery of health care. It's now been adopted by all three boards, and so anyone who is practicing medicine in a way that deviates from the normal standard of care, you know, is in trouble now with the boards of medicine, pharmacy, or, or nursing. What's important is that in the telehealth, every provider must have a Wyoming license because the, the uh, care is being provided is where the patient is, not where the provider is. And that's very important for patient protection because, say, you did a telehealth visit and they misdiagnosed something and you had a bad reaction and you tried to sue the physician uh, for malpractice. Well, if they're in Florida and, you know, he says, well, you can't sue me. I'm in Florida. You'd have to come to Florida and sue me, in, you know, or in court. That's not the way it works. It's not going to be the Florida Board of Medicine who would sanction him. It's Wyoming. And I know that we had one Colorado physician who was practicing telemedicine uh, without a license in the state of California. And he actually got arrested and jailed. For that. So this is very important that you have a Wyoming license for the protection of the patient. And the standard of care is the same as it's in person. And if you don't feel like you can safely provide the same standard of care, you shouldn't be doing the telehealth visit. 
Another thing that people get confused about unless you live in the world of medicine is the difference between licensing and credentialing. So you must have a license to practice medicine within a state and that you get that through the Board of Medicine. But a provider must be credentialed by a hospital to provide care within that setting. That becomes really, oh, back up. there you go, licensing versus credentialing. Uh, <clears throat> a provider must be credentialed by a hospital to provide care within that setting, and it's very specific. So when I was on staff at Poudre Valley Hospital, I was credentialed to just do internal medicine. And even though I was on the staff of that hospital, I could not decide to do heart surgery. I was not credentialed for heart surgery, fortunately. <laughs> so it's very specific. And so when you talk about a telestroke program, which Wyoming Medical Center has now implemented, those physicians have got to be credentialed in each of the facilities they are providing stroke for. And credentialing can be a lengthy process um, for every hospital because that's designated by the federal the government, what's required. However, they have something they call deemed credentialing. It's available, but the hospital board has got to accept that. And what that means is, say, let's say with Wyoming Medical Center, <clears throat> if you are credentialed for neurology at Wyoming Medical Center, the other hospital, if they accept deemed credentialing, can say, well, instead of going through the whole thing of where did he go to medical school, where did he do his residency, where did he have his training, did he pass his boards, does he have malpractice, and all that goes into credentialing, you can just say, well, if it's good enough for Wyoming Medical Center, we will deem that acceptable for us. And that makes it a lot cheaper, faster, and easier to get uh, credential around multiple hospitals. We have the template by the tele Law Association uh, on our web page. That's one of those things on the resources that all the all the boards of any hospital would have to do is to go to there, download it, plug their names in, and have the board pass it. Uh, I have spoken to the hospital association, but boards can sometimes be even more difficult than physicians. But if you really want to bring a lot of outside services into your community access hospital, I would certainly recommend. Uh, having the board take deemed credentialing and passing deemed credentialing, and then you can have the cardiologist, you can have your neurologist, you can have infectious disease, you can have urology, which reminds me, uh, a lot of people think, well, you have some specialty like urology, which is a surgical specialty, you can't do telehealth. That is entirely inaccurate because Dr. Finkelstein, Lisa Finkelstein up in Jackson, is one of our biggest champions of telehealth. And she does teleurology all over, and her patients love it. So, but if you want to have her services in your hospital, you got you should go for deemed credentialing. So, what sort of uses do we currently have for telehealth? Well, most people think automatically about primary care, your your internal medicine, family practice, pediatrician. But as I just talked about. Even get specialist care. We have neurologists, urologists, infectious disease, general surgeons, all providing telehealth care in the state of Wyoming at this time. You, we have a genetics clinic where, for a follow-up, they can do their follow-up via uh, telehealth. We have a long-standing relationship with Barbara Davis Center out of Denver, where our type one diabetic children can get their follow-up care from the Barbara Davis Center via telehealth. And that's a study that I'm on the Institutional Review Board. The patients find it very helpful and very convenient that they don't have to drive to Denver on a regular basis. Uh, I just talked about Wyoming Medical Center and their telestroke care. Um, the fair shift, uh, China Regional Medical Center is doing telepsychiatry around the state of Wyoming. We have a couple of uh, emergency room physicians who are now providing tele-urgent care. Um, uh, Stitches and Hippo Health are two tele-urgent care providers. And you can imagine that, again, if you're in a very rural setting and you've got a problem and you don't have an urgent care or walking clinic nearby, and so you, instead of going to the emergency room, you can actually get urgent care in your home via that. 
And all those are listed again on that list of providers we talked about at the Wyoming Telehealth Network. And they're very easy because those clinics just have an app, and the patients can download the app, and any time they want an urgent care visit, they just, you know, click on it. Psychiatry services we talked about, echo clinics. Echo clinics is a great educational tool. We've been using it more and more in the state of Wyoming where you have regular meetings where you get interested providers calling in, and it's not just physicians. We're now doing this for some of our waiver providers where we're teaching them uh, on best practices. And that's a well-proven model uh, that originated at the University of New Mexico. And we have public health nurse training goes on as well. So talking about geographic disparity, this is the numbers of practicing child adolescent psychiatrists. This was in 2012. We actually have fewer now. I think we're down to four, maybe now five, child psychiatrists in the entire state of Wyoming. So the entire state of Wyoming is a mental health uh, professional shortage area, but child and adolescent psychiatry is particularly grim. And that was leading to a lot of problems because people couldn't get in to see a child adolescent psychiatrist. Even the general psychiatrists were having trouble. A lot of times I was hearing their appointments were out six weeks, eight weeks. If you got a kid in crisis, that doesn't work very well. So this to me is a great example. Go on to the next slide. There you go. So we have a, um, I met with the Wyoming Association of Psychiatric Physicians and said, this is our problem. Kids are going into crisis. They're going in front of the judge because they're hurting themselves, risking themselves or others. They're, and everyone says, what are we going to do with these kids? And so they were putting them in psychiatric residential treatment facilities for a 30-day period to run tests. And say, what's going on with this kid? Well, of course, if you take a kid out of their home and put them in an institution, they destabilize even more. So we were having climbing numbers of kids. They were not getting better. And I said, well, what's this process, this multidisciplinary team process? And basically, there were 27 different people who were touching that kid one way or the other, social workers, CFS, et cetera, not one physician. And so you have 27 lay people looked at the kid. The judge would say, I don't know what to do. Let's put them in the PRT yet. And so that was a major issue that was affecting most most importantly, the quality of care the kid was going to get and was costing the state a ton of money and not getting good outcomes. So we wanted to provide timely access to children, expand access to out-of-state providers through telehealth, and get fewer inappropriate inpatient residential placements. So we signed a contract with the uh, University of Washington, which is Wyoming's medical school, we're a whammy state, and so through Seattle Children's Hospital, which is the pediatric wing of the medical school, they are able to provide either phone consultations, you know, nine to six, Monday through Friday, for any child in the state of Wyoming. They did not, they do not need to be a Medicaid client. So if you're seeing any kid and you're a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA and things aren't going well, you can talk to a board certified child, faculty member, child adolescent psychiatry, at no cost to anyone. But before our MDT hearings, we require that they be seen by a board certified child adolescent psychiatrist. And that cut our admission rates by 50% because the child adolescent psychiatrist was able to, he is a telehealth, get a proper diagnosis, make proper recommendations, and connect them to community therapies. So that was really important. And what we saw is we were able to reduce the number of admissions, we were able to reduce the length of stay, and we had a two to one return on investment from the state of Wyoming from this contract. And also the number of our children who are now exceeding too high a dose of psychotropic medications, too many psychotropic medications, or too young in age, we have some of the lowest rates in the nation right now thanks to this. So we saw a profound decrease in inappropriate prescribing, shall we say. So that was, that's a great example of where a very focused, specific model works. 
So what are some of the uh, current programs that we have in the state of Wyoming? Well, we've already talked about the Wyoming Telehealth Network, Cheyenne Regional. I should have left off Wyoming Medical Center, but they should go right there. We also, in uh, Sublette County, we now have a nursing home pilot project where the, the patient, instead of being transported via ambulance, they're you know, contacting the physician via telehealth and keeping the patient in their nursing home bed. Uh, we're hoping that more nursing homes will adopt that policy. Uh, Avera is a system out of South Dakota that, with the help of the Helmsley Charitable Trust, uh, set up a uh, telestroke, uh, I'm sorry, tele-emergency room, telepharmacy, and tele-ICU in several Wyoming-specific places. So it costs multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars to make sure there's adequate broadband going into the facility. They had a dedicated line. And back in Sioux Falls, they've got a bank of physicians and nurses monitoring all this stuff real time. And so it's a great example of how uh, smaller critical access hospital can access, you know, state-of-the-art specialists in, instantaneously. And so that, that's a wonderful project. It is important to remember, however, that when we're trying to report on this, we have the out-of-state commercial program, uh, Doctor on Call, Teladoc, things like that. We have no way to track how frequently those are being accessed. Um, their quality of care, no reporting at all. And, you know, like that one example with pharmacists uh, showed us, you know, that is a concern to me. Now, and what happens is a lot of our insurance companies are hiring these Teladoc outfits <clears throat> because it saves them money. And we also have an out-of-state health system. So people like CU and University are also uh, trying to provide telehealth services in the state of Wyoming. So why aren't we getting more uptake at the moment? This is a relatively recent uh, barrier study that the telehealth consortium did. And what you see, so 50% are thinking that well, our reimbursement is a barrier, a significant barrier. But if you got parity, that same as in person, why would, you know, Medical reimbursement be a barrier. Lack of tele technical staff. Well, um, sometimes you need a little technical help setting up a Zoom license, but uh, most of the time it goes very smoothly. And we do have technical support available through the University of Wyoming. Time commitment. If you're going to see the patient anyway, it doesn't matter if you're walking into exam room two or if you're sitting at your desk uh, in your office. The time commitment is uh, the same, really. My, in my experience, actually, sometimes even less. Training, uh, again, learning how to operate a Zoom license is not too challenging. Initial costs, well, it's hard to be free. I think most offices have at least a computer with a uh, camera on it. And here's what I think is the real one, which is medical staff resistance. <laughs> and Doctors, we can be a stubborn breed, and this is the way I've always done it, and I don't need to change because my life is too busy and, and hectic as it is. But um, when you look at the shortages, the most significant medical Medicaid shortages, most people are saying mental health is, again, still our biggest barrier. And when you look at the numbers of suicides in the frontier of Wyoming, uh, substance abuse in uh, rural Wyoming. That really worries me. They're all important, but I think mental health is one of the prime problems. So what do patients think about this? Well, we've actually done some patient satisfaction surveys. When I talked about a couple of hours windshield time, when you, this is a slide that says, how many miles would you need to travel to see a psychiatrist in person? Over a quarter of them had to drive over 100 miles that last one here. And you think about that. That's 100 miles to see a 15-minute appointment. That doesn't make any sense. So that, again, shows the health inequity around the state of Wyoming. 
So when patients think about it, where you're comfortable. Well, if you're going, if you're getting almost a 98% yes answer on that, I would say they're fairly comfortable. Well, that may be okay for you, but would you recommend it to someone else? Or do you prefer to be in person or a video? 85% preferred telehealth. And in a way, it's a lot more comfortable. You know, you're not in the room with them. You can just sort of, you know, quite getting used to the idea of interacting via monitors anyway. Uh, and especially for rural Wyoming, they don't see your pickup truck parked in front of the mental health clinic now. <laughs> but it actually increases patient privacy that you can see your mental health provider uh, from the security of your own house. And I think that's really important because we all know it, and especially in smaller towns, everybody knows everyone else's vehicle. And they know where the mental health clinic is, too. And tongues wag. How about would you recommend a video visit to a friend or family member? 96%? Yeah, you know, just amazing. So to say that the patients aren't going to like it or that it's too expensive or it's too inconvenient, those really don't happen, so it's that, it's that provider resistance. And so what I'm hoping is we can get, A, more providers interested in providing this service, and B, I want the patients to start saying, thank you for seeing me this time. Can I see you next time via telehealth? When the patients recommend or are pushing for it, then it will get better adoption. So let's shift gears a little bit to the Department of Health and telehealth. <clears throat> Two more slides on. There you go. So, so what is the Department of Health doing to support telehealth? Well, first we provide those free HIPAA compliant access to telehealth software to providers, currently through our Zoom platform. Eventually, I'd like to just make, turn this into a, a giant app that patients can download their app. That's probably the next generation. We offer distance learning for providers via Zoom. We are reimbursing providers at the same rate for telehealth and in-person. <coughs> we have a collaboration within the WDH to deliver services via telehealth, including public health nursing, <coughs> uh, follow-up appointments for genetics clinics, behavioral health services to the community mental health clinic, multidisciplinary team meetings at, with PRTF, facility review, and child psychiatry, like we talked about. Next slide. I got to <laughs> There's a couple of different ways that we can look at this. And when we start trying to present back to the director here, it gets confusing because they say, well, what are your numbers looking like? So this is a slide that talks about Medicaid. What did Medicaid pay for and each starting from 2011 down to 2019? And what we can say is we are have now grown to we had 91 different unique providers providing <coughs> compared to 26 in the beginning. Uh, and that the last column is still for uh, fiscal year, so those numbers are going up. So at that time, this uh, data was pulled. There was 1,341 unique uh, patients, and over 4,000. It's going to be oh, almost 5,000. So that's what Medicaid, we know, and it doesn't matter what platform, this is what we paid for. The next slide shows what's going through our Zoom licenses. <clears throat> and so you can see the number of Zoom encounters are going up every year. Number of claims is going up. But this is not just Medicaid, this is all payers. This is just who's using the Zoom platform. So we don't have complete cross-connectivity between um, and the next slide shows, uh, again, some usage <clears throat> just for this year. So you can see 188 providers hosted means there are 14,847 participants. Now, remember, this is not just clinical telemedicine. This is all telehealth. This is the educational meeting. But you can see our numbers are getting to be fairly respectable. Next slide. So... That, so far, I've been focusing on the clinical side, but what I'm trying to start to make the case for you is, and <clears throat> we made this all in case when they thought, well, telehealth isn't that important. And the hospital 
far, but you, you know, they sort of understand that. But when payers contract with national firms for telehealth, it does mean reduced cost to them and low copay for the enrollee in their convenience. And I know I talk to Xenials and Millennials and younger people, and they just love it. You know, because they have fairly simple problems. They can sit at their desk, plug their headphones in, and have a doctor's appointment. And they just pay $9. And we're very happy with that $9. But it's not just the $9 copay that we pay, but the entire encounter fee. And that entire encounter fee is after 992 and 3 or 992 and 4 can be $50, $75, $90. <clears throat> and that's left the state, too. And so, and those are some of your easiest visits. So if you're really looking at a business model, you're going, I'm going to let a hundred of these visits leave a month, you know, over a thousand a year. Uh, I mean, I could start cutting into some of your hope, you know, in terms of your bottom line. And what we're seeing is because these things are growing, if providers within the state do not embrace Technology, the economic impact is going to continue to grow. And <clears throat> that's something that I think they're beginning to do that. And that's why I think China Regional and Wyoming Medical Center, and I know I'm going to be talking to Sweetwater in a bit as well about how can they get into telehealth. But if we can strengthen our network, because again, I'm worried about those providers in the most rural access. And if you can have an app, and they have them now. Where instead of plugging in with the doctor in his pajamas in Florida, you know, they just wear a white coat and shirt on the top of their pajamas. So um, they can connect to their own physician and Wyoming physicians and Wyoming hospitals and Wyoming systems. We're strengthening our Wyoming health care infrastructure, not weakening it. So I really think that's very important. And that's probably the biggest case I can make because uh, as much as I love University of Colorado and others like that, I want my main concern is how do I strengthen the net health infrastructure in Wyoming? So next slide. Ten more minutes. I'll have time for questions. Well, I'm worried about broadband capacity, which is why I'm glad the broadband uh, council kept telehealth on because if our technology gets more and more complicated and more and more imaging, we have health information exchange and, and others, we need to make sure our broadband capacity keeps pace as usage goes up and as the bandwidth goes up. How do we overcome provider resistance? Our early adopters are using it a lot. They're happy with it. The patients love it, but not enough providers are providing it yet. And so how can we overcome provider resistance? Corporate resistance, and by that, you know, sort of in the hospitals, nursing homes, et cetera, I think telehealth would be fantastic again for, say, the energy firms. You know, they've got people spread all over the state of Wyoming. Uh, instead of air ambulancing people, if they could do a lot via telehealth, I think that'd be great. Schools, if the kid could see a uh, physician or a nurse practitioner, be you know, when they're not feeling good, then they can say, okay, do we need to go back to the classroom, uh, just go home, or come into my office right away, or go straight to the emergency room? You can triage all that right away. What is the role of this? And this is a real question. We just talked about this at our last uh, joint labor meeting when Director Forson was there. The legislature and the governor are talk about telehealth, what is our role of the state in promoting and enhancing telehealth services? You know, as, as said, this is a broad area and sort of strays beyond just the Medicaid, but if, we're, if we really want to make this a state priority, then we're going to need more than the very small amount of money that comes from the Office of Rural Health and Medicaid, because that is just enough to support our current level. It's really hard for us to expand. And finally, what are the specific problems should the state attempt to address through telehealth? And uh, Director Ceballos has called for a meeting regarding this in July. And so I think these are the questions. We, we just need some clarity. And if they want us to go forward, 
we've got these infrastructure already in place. And I think that's important for people to take away from this is you don't need to build a network. We've got a network. We need to increase the utilization of that network. So uh, we've got, got a few minutes left. Happy to answer any questions.
great example where there was no resource in the state. We were able to bring them in and everyone had access to the same system. So uh, Dr. Bartholomew, he would have his neurology provided by um, Casper. He would have his cardiology provided by Cheyenne because he was referring to the individual physician. So you're competing on your services and access, not on whose staff are you on. Well, thank you. Alyssa. And Dr.
Great. Well, thank you all. I hope this, this everyone know, now know a lot about telehealth. Definitely, Dr. Bush. Thank you.